Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Will he want a gold medal with a broken freaking neck? He's a real athlete, so give him your respect. He's got intensity, integrity, intelligence too. Oh, it's true, it's damn true. So if he ever finds you and you're chanting you suck, then he'll douse you in dairy with his big milk truck. And with one angle slam, he'll lay you out on the floor. So listen up, it's time to go. It's the Kurt Angle Show. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to the Kurt Angle Show. And of course, we couldn't do it without your Olympic hero and mine, Mr. Kurt Angle. Kurt, how are you, man? I'm doing fantastic. How you doing, Conrad? Man, so excited to be here. We've had a lot of fun on the show, and we're going to keep the hits going today. Uh, I don't know what you've seen, but dude, the feedback I got from the shows that you and Paul did have been off the charts. Uh, and yeah, we were doing pretty well, man. We were kicking some ass while you were gone, Conrad. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to be back. And I know you were glad to be back off air. You were telling me that, uh, you recently had the experience from WrestleCade and man, that's one of the first sort of post COVID if there is even such a thing, but supposedly it was just jam packed. What was your experience? Yeah, there had to be 7,000 people there. It, it was pretty wow. awesome. They, they had to open up a bunch of rooms. They had sting in one separate room alone <laughs> because there were just so many people demanding, uh, that some of the big stars, there were, you know, other wrestlers there that, you know, were uh, not as big, but uh, everybody was busy. Business was really good. The fans were excited to see the wrestlers. The wrestlers were excited to see the fans. It was an awesome promotion. Well, I'm so glad to hear it. You know, it feels like uh, we've been almost in a, in a bizarro world the last couple of years. So oh, for things God. to be back to normal a little bit and a big successful WrestleCade, that was fun, man. I'm sure you guys had a, had a great time. Yes, sir. We did. Well, we're going to keep the great times going today. Uh, we're going to be talking about vengeance 2001. I can't believe this has been 20 years ago, Kurt. This was like 10 years ago, not 20. Yeah. Time flies really quickly, man. It's been like 20 years and it, it feels like only a few years. I, I, I can't believe that I've actually been retired for gosh, uh, three years now. So, uh, you know, the time goes by very quickly. You're absolutely right. Well, of course, at the beginning of your career here, I mean, you had such an incredible 2001 and, uh, we're going to keep it going here as we talk about the November transition into December, which is where vengeance 2001 happened. Let's pick it up. I guess the Monday night after survivor series, that's where you would help the world wrestling federation end the Alliance. Uh, the show is in Charlotte on the Monday night raw after, and the focus of the show is the WWF of course, uh, winning. And now you saving the company. And so you're going to go up to the rock and ask him to thank you for saving the WWF. Are you excited to at least be back in that, that heel capacity? Because the whole Alliance thing really threw everything off. Who's a good guy. Who's a bad guy. It was less about traditional heels and baby faces and more about brands. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were so called the heels, the Alliance, but we weren't really heels. Uh, but you know, uh, going up to the rock, you know, Vince McMahon came to me and said, listen, I want you as a heel. Um, you know, uh, after you save the company, which should make you a baby face, 
you know, he saved the WWF from WCW from the Alliance. Um, uh, it's going to turn you baby face, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you demand thank yous from the other wrestlers the next day. So uh, it was easy uh, to do that. And, uh, you know, the fans crapped on me. <laughs> it was, it was awesome. Uh, I, I stayed a heel and uh, continue my uh, run as a heel. So it was really cool. How weird is it too, in hindsight, you know, nobody could have predicted back here in December of 2001. My goodness, the rock is going to become the biggest movie star in the whole world. I guess he is. Yeah. Uh, I, you know what? I, 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 the thing is, Everybody knew Dwayne was going to be a big star. He was the most entertaining guy in sports entertainment. He really was. And Hollywood was looking at him for a long time. And, you know, right away, I think in 2000, they signed him to a five picture deal. Um, um, I believe it was, um, I can't remember the, the studio, um, but uh, you know, rock was on his way. All he had to do is, is fall in suit, uh, go through the motions you know, take some acting classes and, and we all knew he was going to be a big star in Hollywood. So, you know, we should talk about the first big movie. Uh, I know he did some cameos and stuff on like that 70s show. And I think he was even like a star Trek Voyager episode and all that jazz, but the mummy returns in 2001 is New line really... cinemas. That's a promotion. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, and so then he would do the scorpion King and he did the rundown and he did walking tall you've tried your hand at acting. Did you first see maybe the groundwork that rock was laying here and think, Hey, I want to try that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I actually thought I'd have a great, great opportunity. Um, I think what, what happened with me was uh, I was doing movies. I did uh, warrior. I did um, Dylan dog. Uh, I was a small part in painting game with the rock uh, started doing movies, but you know, my behavior with the, you know, the alcohol and the DUIs got me into a, a little bit of a bind with Hollywood. So uh, they, they stopped calling, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I've been spending the last eight or nine years trying to gain my reputation back uh, so that Hollywood would continue to or start to call me back again. So um, it's just one of those things that I dug myself into a hole and I have to get myself out of it. Well, I think you've done a great job with that. I mean, certainly everyone listening to this knows that uh, you're reliable. I mean, buddy, we've been taping the podcast at the exact same time on the exact same day this entire time. So uh, I, I have to have repetition. Man. <laughs> it's it's got to be the same day, the same time every week. <laughs> you know what, though? That makes sense when you look at your history and how you got ready for the Olympics and stuff. I mean, you had to be a training machine, so everything was timed and planned out. And that's still the way you live your life all these years later. But it's interesting to think 20 years ago when you're brushing up against the rock, I mean, he's going to have the biggest movie in the history of Netflix. I don't even think anybody knew what that was going to be back then, but he's just surpassed every sort of milestone that you could put on a sports entertainer from a, from a movie or Hollywood standpoint, if you will. And it feels like a lot of guys have started to follow in his footsteps. And, and, and if we only knew back then, right, what was going to happen? Yeah, you know, it's the thing is sports entertainment, wrestling in general, pro wrestling, um, you are kind of acting to yeah. some degree. So um, you do have a, a, a footprint in there to, 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 to continue on to Hollywood. Uh, you're going to have to take acting classes. Uh, you know, one thing I learned with my acting classes where um, I project my voice too loud. I'm doing it right now. Um, you know, when you act, they want you to stay low tone and and uh, only when you're upset or, or excited or angry do you yell. But I, I always project my voice because of pro wrestling. Right. When you're doing promos, you're, you're saying it at a very high, you know. Uh, rate all of, you people out there. All that. Yeah. Stuff. So I, 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 we're having a hard time breaking that habit. And, uh, you know, my acting coach tells me every week, you got to stop. You got to calm down, lower your voice a little bit. Be in the, be in the scene. Don't act like you're cutting a promo in professional wrestling. Well, it is worth mentioning too, though, you know, to your point about, Hey, we're all kind of doing acting and wrestling. This is like, unlike a Hollywood production. I mean, you've made a few films yourself. They could spend the entire day on one scene versus, you know, when you're producing a Monday night raw or a SmackDown, people are doing those scenes throughout the day. And it's, it's done. I don't know, 14 scenes in a day, just done. Versus in, in Hollywood, man, they would spend multiple days, maybe weeks producing that same amount of content. 
Oh, without a doubt. Uh, you know, the thing is, wrestling is fast paced. You've mm -hmm. got to keep it fast paced because you only have a certain amount of time during the day before the show starts. So if you don't get it done during the day, you are gonna have to do it live, live at night. And, uh, you know, the, that would be a lot more pressure on you, but it happens quite a bit. Sometimes we don't get to the pre-tapes we need to get to during the day and we film them live at night during the show. Do you find, uh, the Hollywood experience at times to be more frustrating because on, on the wrestling side, timeline wise, you know, it's sort of one take Jake, you're in and you're out versus <laughs> you're right. You're doing um, the same thing. It, it's very slow and methodical. It's a lot of hurry up and wait. Yeah. It can get a little frustrating, but you have to, um, accept that and just say, you know what, I'm not going to be impatient. I'm just going to wait for everybody to be ready. And then I will be ready. So it's just one of those things you have to deal with. So your interaction here on the Monday night raw in Charlotte, right after the survivor series, your interaction with the rock is going to lead to you two guys facing off for the world titles. That's WCW is done. Uh, the rock ultimately gets the win when he reverses an ankle lock into a cradle and you attack the rock after the match, but the tables are turned until Jericho comes out and, uh, you destroy him in this era. Are you more comfortable working as a heel or a baby face? I mean, you started as a heel, but you've gotten a taste of the baby face and in hindsight, maybe it was questionable to make you a heel and then a baby face around nine 11. Cause it felt like everybody wanted to cheer you, but now you're, you're back as a heel again. Did you think it was too much back and forth? Or did you have a preference of heel or baby at this time? Well, I just thought they took the baby face thing away from me too soon. I was just starting to get comfortable as a baby face. Wasn't quite there yet. And my, my only baby face run was my program with Austin when he was a heel. They wanted a formidable opponent for Austin. So they, they uh, switched me from heel to baby face because they switched him to heel. So we ended up wrestling each other. But, um, you know, I, I, there, was, there was nothing really I could do about it. Sure. I get it. It's a wrestling podcast, but he's saving us money on our mortgage. Do you really trust this process? The reviews don't lie. Five-star review after five-star review. We make it fast. We make it easy and it's no cost or obligation. Give us a shot to earn your business. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did, especially if you like keeping more of your own money. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. So what are you waiting for? Hurry to save with Conrad.com. Well, the close of the show has Vince McMahon come out and attempt to strip Steve Austin of the WWF world championship. And he's trying to reward it to you <laughs> yeah, I remember until he's that. interrupted by Ric Flair's return to the WWF. And again, we're in Charlotte. So the pop is gigantic. He hasn't been a part of the company since what January of 93 and the show ends with Austin attacking you while Flair watches. Let's talk about Rick for a minute. Was this the first time you met Ric Flair in real life? I know you had had a conversation with him before you got into wrestling, but is this your first time in real life meeting him? No, I met him at Gold's Gym in Charlotte, North Carolina. I believe it was his Gold's Gym. And that's where he told me that he didn't want me to go to WCW. He said, I think you should go to WWF and uh, Vince McMahon will take care of you. He said, WCW is a shit storm right now. It's, you know, the, these guys are real political and they're going to stomp on you. You're not going to go anywhere. You go to WWF and Vince McMahon will make sure you go to the top. And he was right. So I, I had a nice conversation with Rick and I didn't see him until this night. And, uh, it was, um, it's the first time I saw Rick or I was face to face with Rick in the ring. So that was the first time. And, and Rick, of course, wrestled amateur a little bit, but boy, his son Reed, uh, he was the apple of Rick's eye and he was knee deep in amateur wrestling. So I'm sure Rick was excited to see you again here as well. Yeah. He's a big amateur wrestling fan. He loves the sport. Uh, he was so proud of Reed and what Reed accomplished. He had a really great career. He done, did extremely well. It was just unfortunate what happened to him. Did you keep up with any of Reed's amateur career? Cause I know the wrestling community is relatively small. So I assume there were coaches or trainers that he probably worked with along the way that you were at least familiar with, right? Yes, he actually went to Blair Academy, which is the top wrestling school in the nation. It's a private school, but they they are like they kick ass in high school. They're like number one in the nation almost every year. And Reed ended up getting a scholarship there, which is incredible. And I think uh you may be friends with TJ Jaworski. Is that right? 
Yes, TJ uh, trained uh, Reed, and TJ was incredible in college. He was a three-time national champion. I thought he was going to make the Olympic team. He didn't do it, but um, he, he was talented enough to make the team. Uh, he was one of the most dominating wrestlers I've ever seen in amateur wrestling. That guy had a lot of skill. Still a good uh, friend of Rick's to this day. And, and you're in the ring that day when Ric Flair makes his triumphant return to pro wrestling. Because when WCW goes down, we don't really see Rick again after that. And now he pops up here on Monday Night Raw, but not just any Raw, in Charlotte. How big was that pop? Oh, it was enormous. <laughs> it's bigger than biggest pop I ever heard. Uh, I mean, it is Ric Flair in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's his hometown. And the fans were really hyped to see him, especially in a WWE ring. It's really crazy when you think about what's happening here in this segment. You know, Jericho, Austin, uh, Ric Flair, Vince McMahon, Kurt Angle. Gosh, there's so much star power here. And the next day you're in Fayetteville, North Carolina for SmackDown. And you're going to be wrestling The Undertaker when Vince tries to interfere on your behalf and Taker walks off. Uh, Meltzer absolutely loved the match, said it was a great match. Uh, and at, at different times, it didn't always feel like you and Undertaker had the best chemistry. Maybe it was just an off day or something wasn't clicking. But on this day in particular, it just really worked. Do you remember this match in particular? Yes, this is when he was the American badass. And we had an incredible match. I was really happy about that. Uh, Meltzer was absolutely right. The match was really good. It's one of the best matches I have with Undertaker uh, outside of no, no way out 2006 when he was the Undertaker. We had a pretty amazing match there as well. What makes a good match for the Undertaker? Like as his dance partner, what do you need to do to make the match as good as possible? Well, you know, Undertaker is so talented. He could do anything, you know, as far as uh, false finishes and, and uh, submission trade-offs, he, he is really good, especially for a big guy. And uh, for, with me, he was able to do a lot of submission trade-offs, and we were going back and forth, and it worked extremely well. Undertaker was a big MMA fan, and uh, he, he would work a little bit of jiu-jitsu. Him and his wife, uh, old wife, ex ex-wife at the time, would do a lot of jiu-jitsu, and uh, he was learning. And uh, so we, we had great chemistry. It is interesting to think about what if, I mean, I think the undertaker, even this year has sort of freestyled in an alternate universe, you know, he might've pursued MMA. Of course he lacked the amateur wrestling background, but his interest in MMA, I think greatly influenced his wrestling career in a positive way. Started wearing those gloves and doing some of the different submissions and part of his matches. And that was something we didn't really see a lot of in that era. I mean, this is really before the UFC is going to become what it became, you know, four or five years later. Uh, but it, it is sort of fun to think about. Can you imagine in an alternate reality, the undertaker in an octagon? I could, he's a badass. Uh, he can throw punches like no other. Uh, he's a great athlete. I knew he would adapt to jujitsu, jiu grappling, wrestling, whatever it had to be. Um, there are a lot of good big guys in, in the MMA and undertaker would have been one of the best. It's also announced here that you, Chris Jericho, Steve Austin, and The Rock are going to have basically a miniature tournament to merge the WCW and WWF world titles together. That's a pretty big deal. You know, it's almost like a dream scenario from the old after magazines. What if this champion wrestled that champion? And of course, the whole invasion thing is now in the rear view, but we do have this WCW world title, so it makes sense to use it. Uh, did you have any sort of idea what the creative was going to be when you first heard about this tournament? Um, I just knew that they wanted to combine the titles. They wanted yeah. an undisputed champion because WCW was no longer. And they picked, uh, I guess, the top four guys that they thought deserved it. And uh, I was actually surprised I was one of them, uh, considering I was only in the business about a year and a half. So, um, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of pressure on me at that particular time because I was still getting um, – getting my feet wet as far as being a worker. So, it, you know, I was still learning and, and getting better each and every uh, show that I did. So I, I was really surprised I was part of this, but, you know, for some reason they thought I was one of the top four guys in the company. Do you think in hindsight, and of course hindsight's 2020, and we always say that here on the show, but do you think in hindsight it would have made sense to have one champion stick around raw, one champion stick around SmackDown, and then build towards a WCW title versus a WWF title at WrestleMania? Or do you think the company was just ready to just 
wash their hands of all this invasion stuff and move on. <laughs> I think that Vince regretted doing it. That's what I think. I think it was a big headache for him. And uh, I think he wanted to get it over and done by combining the titles. I think it's a great idea to have a world title on Raw and SmackDown and have a WWF versus WCW WrestleMania a world title main event. That would have been awesome. I think uh, the company would have made a lot of money on that. But I think Vince just wanted to be done with it. So there's an infamous Raw that takes place the next week in Oklahoma City. We just recently talked about it on Grilling JR not too long ago. But before we get to that famous segment, Kurt, you open up that raw bragging about your sports and academic accomplishments, being a heel in the ring, cutting a promo with Vince McMahon, talking about how great you are, buddy. This is classic Kurt angle stuff here. Is it not? <laughs> yes. Have a Vince McMahon putting me over the whole time. And uh, me just sitting there, it was easy as hell. Uh, <laughs> you know, Vince is awesome. Uh, you know, I love when he does promos, he's so entertaining and funny. Um, uh, him being out there doing that for me just got me even more heat. It's interesting too, to look back at this time, because these days it almost feels like Vince doesn't want to be on camera. He, he wants to let the younger generation do their thing. He doesn't want to be reliant on his heel persona on television anymore. And we've seen over the years, him do less and less of this. So that's an experience that a lot of the main roster will never get to experience, but from your perspective, as one of the best performers in the business here in 01, how good was Vince at being a heel and manipulating that crowd when he was, say, in his prime here in 01? Oh, he was awesome. You know, I think the reason Vince McMahon did this is because he actually became a WWE superstar. The fans wanted to see him. They demanded him. Um, I don't think Vince wanted to step in there and do it. I think he did it because he had to because of the fans. Uh, you know, they reacted to Vince like no other. He was, he was the guy, man. He, he, he was entertaining. He was funny. He pissed people off. He, he had a, he had a lot of ammo and, uh, he was one of the biggest stars in the company at this particular time. And I believe Vince finally smartened up and said, you know what? I need to back off, uh, stay away from TV and let these wrestlers become the bigger stars. When you're doing a segment with Vince, We've talked a little bit before how as wrestling evolved, more and more guys would try to plan their matches and just sort of talk through, here's what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and all that. Do you do that with Vince on a segment like this, or is Vince so busy with the rest of his day of running the show that you just sort of hope it goes well, but you know, Vince is a great performer, so he's going to hold up his end of the bargain. Or do you do some sort of walkthrough with Vince before the doors open? It's a quick walkthrough. It lasts one minute. Vince brings you in his office. He says, listen, we're going to do this promo. I'm going to say this. You say that I'll say this we will be done. And you go out there and you, you basically, um, you don't really go by the script. You have to improvise because we didn't rehearse it enough to go by the script. So Vince McMahon is more of a, um, you know, improv improv. Yes. He's an improv guy and he's the best at it. The only other person I know that's just as good is, uh, is, uh, stone cold. He, he was also a great improviser. I could have finished your sentence there. I knew where you were going to go. Those guys <laughs> were just natural, especially together. Um, something else I want to ask you about Vince, since we're talking about him, it's long been rumored that whenever a guy is going into the hall of fame and he's going to receive his hall of fame induction, and now he's going to give his big speech, thanking the fans and everybody specifically, it's been said that Vince does not want you to thank him. Was that your experience? Yes. And I had. I want to thank Vince McMahon for everything he did for me. And he said, Kurt, take that out. <laughs> he said, I don't want anybody thanking me. I do not want to thank you. I don't want you to even thank the company. I want you to thank the fans and whoever else you want, but do not thank me or the company. Leave my name out of it. That's how Vince is. He never wants the credit for anything. Tremendous. Uh, Vince is going to make a handicap match with you and Jericho against rock. Uh, but flair comes out and inserts Kane into the match. And of course, rock gets the win over Jericho in a, a DDT. Um, do you think you're the top heel at this point in the company, just in your mind, or do you think you're neck and neck with Jericho? We know the end of the story is they're going to try to make Jericho here at vengeance 2001, but get leading into this. Did you feel like they were trying to push him past you or 
you guys were already on the same level or wh where did you think you were slotted on the heel side of things? I think I was a top heel at that particular time. I think that Jericho became the top heel when he won the undisputed championship because he was the undisputed champion. Uh, and, and you know what, rightfully so I, I believe Chris deserved the title. It was his time to shine and, uh, he never got any other opportunity before this. So this was, this was his, uh, first and only opportunity to make it big in the company. So it's you in the ring with Vince McMahon, uh, when he's going to attempt to make Steve Austin kiss his ass as a part <laughs> of the kiss my ass club, uh, ultimately after he has him do mouthwash and chapstick and <laughs> handful of other things. He's even going to show Austin that his ass can do tricks, whatever that means. Uh, Austin low blows Vince and then whips Vince's bare ass. And so here you are an Olympic gold medalist <laughs> watching the CEO of a major company drop his pants and expose his bare ass and the biggest star in the history of wrestling almost kiss it. This has got to be one of the wildest days in your sports entertainment career. It is. I could never get used to it. You know, Vince was like a big kid. He always wanted to do immature shit. And this was one of them. I mean, you know, Vince loved the kiss my ass club. Uh, you know, he, he did it all too frequently, probably way too much at this particular time. There was a lot of ass kissing at this particular time. So Vince absolutely loved it. And he was one funny guy. When it's uh, all over, you point to Jim Ross laughing at Vince. And of course, JR is at the desk doing commentary, but you're pointing him out like, look, this guy's laughing at you. You drag him into the ring. And you're going to try to make him kiss Vince's ass. And all of a sudden, the Undertaker's music hits and everybody is excited to see, oh, now the Undertaker is going to come lay waste to Vince McMahon. But it turns out that's not the case. He says, nobody kissed more ass than me. And are you saying you're better than me, Jr.? And he forces Jr.'s face into Vince's ass, and it's all in Jr.'s hometown, Oklahoma City. What's going through your mind when you see this? The whole time, I don't want to do this. Yeah, way too much respect for Jr. He doesn't deserve this. This is crap. <laughs> I really did. I I didn't feel comfortable at all doing it. I I was really divided about it. And I did let Vince McMahon know that, but, um, you know, Vince wanted to do this and this is what you have to do when you're a wrestler, you have to listen to your boss. You know, there's, there's two schools of thought here. A, a lot of wrestling fans would say, oh, well, he's just, he's trying to book heat. I know that's what Bruce Pritchard would think. And I think in hindsight, even Jr. does that he wanted to get, you know, this sympathetic baby face in his hometown, Jim Ross, this would really cement the undertaker and Vince McMahon and yourself as these ultra heel villains. But some other people say, nope, this is just Vince McMahon being mean spirited and trying to humiliate a guy that he thought he could in Jim Ross. And I know that that's the way Jim Ross's wife felt. JR recently talked about this though, Kurt. And he said, if I had it to do over again, I wish I would have been more business and less pout boy about it. Uh, where do you land on that? Do you think that Vince maybe has a, a mean spirited spot or was this simply trying to get heat? Well, I think it was both. I think that he wanted to get heat, but it was another way for Vince to stick it to Jr. Um, for whatever reason. Um, I, I don't know if this is when Jr. left the company. I can't remember, but, um, you know, Vince, um, felt that Jr. his services, uh, were no longer needed. And, um, he, he, and I, I, I don't want to explain why, but he just felt uncomfortable with, with uncomfortable with Jr. being the commentator. So I'm not sure if this is the time when they, um, switch Jr. with somebody else, but, uh, I know eventually they did. Yeah. I think this is around the time that his contract was going to be expiring and there was some, you know, discussions. Is he going to continue? Will he be back? And, uh, boy, it was just a mess and getting to know Jr. You can't help, but feel bad for him, but it's interesting, oh. you know, wrestling, I think sometimes changes you, you know, changes your perspective because even Jim who wrote about this in his book and how hurtful it was to his family, specifically his wife, Jan, he also says, man, I wish I would have handled that better. So, uh, he, you, you need to have thick skin in this business. And I think Jr. realizes that, and he understands that. 
So you wind up wrestling edge on SmackDown and you get a win. This is 2001 here. Edge is not yet the rated R superstar and the top guy that he would become a few years later. Uh, obviously he had had tremendous success with Christian. They had a tag title run unlike anybody else. And I know you and he go way back, but did you think edge in 2001 was ready to be not just an intercontinental guy, but a top guy? Oh yeah. I thought he was ready in 2000 uh, edge ever since I started, uh, the kid's been ready. So I knew he was going to be a big star. Eventually I thought they should have pushed him a lot earlier. Uh, you're working pretty hard with Austin on all the house shows in this era. Do you remember what the money was like back then? I'm not asking for you to give specifics, but <laughs> if you're working on top with Austin in a one where seemingly the business is trending down post WrestleMania 17, is it still like high fives all around when the paydays come out or is it starting to get a little disappointing? Like, damn it. I was expecting more for me. It was awesome. <laughs> right. You now the pay was two or three times more than I usually got even being in the main event. When you're up against the top guy in the company, you're going to get paid a lot more money. And uh, there, there were there were a lot of top guys in that company. You know, was, if you wrestled uh, Austin or The Rock or Undertaker or Triple H, you got paid the big bucks. It was it was uh, relatively simple. That's just how it was. And uh, eventually, I became a top guy, and anybody who wrestled me got the big bucks. So, um, you know, eventually down the road, I ended up being one of the top three guys in the business. And, uh, anybody that would wrestle me would get that kind of money too. I want to mention, you know, in these house show matches, we've never really talked about how physical they could be. Austin has earned a reputation for being, I guess what a lot of guys would call snug. Sometimes whenever he would have people on his podcast, like John Cena, for instance, he would say, oh man, you got to snug up that STF. It's a little too loose for me. And He's even been critical way back when of Jeff Jarrett said, oh, he didn't run the ropes hard enough and things like that. Did you find working with Austin to be more difficult or more physical than any other opponent? Or was that not your experience? Yes. Him and Chris Benoit were the two most physical athletes I've ever faced in the ring. Austin was very physical. That that's the one thing about him uh, that made him special. He was really intense. He kept the, the intensity up very high and he was very physical. Did you have a preference? You know, you've told us before here on the show that sometimes when Shawn Michaels would hit you with the super kick, you wouldn't even feel it, uh, but it looked phenomenal. But then with Austin, if he's throwing some lefts and rights, well, some of those are going to land. Did you have yeah, a preference? Are land. <laughs> yeah, I, I was comfortable with being snug because I was snug. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that that's just one thing that I, 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 I tried to work on my finesse, but there were times, you know, when I throw punches or kicks, they're going to, they're going to stick. They're going to hurt. And uh, Austin was the same way. And uh, so you, I, I enjoyed that because I, in order to give it, you have to be able to take it. And I did. So in, in a match like that, where you're working with Austin and he hits you with uh, for lack of a better word, a live round, uh, you know, that's his style. So maybe you don't take it personally, but just because it's protocol, do you send a, a live round back as a, a, I guess they call it a receipt in the business. I never sent a receipt because I didn't even know if someone was trying to stiff me uh, because I work snug as it is. And if somebody stiffed me, I, I just thought they were snug. So I, I didn't even know if I ever got a receipt for anything I did, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's just a part of uh, being uh, very physical in the business. I, I, that's the way I am. And, and uh, I, I, I would expect the same from the other guys. Uh, there's talk with the emergence of flair. Uh, of turning raw and SmackDown into separate brands at the time. We sort of freestyled that earlier. Do you remember that ever being discussed? I mean, I think once upon a time, they even kicked around the idea of naming one of the shows nitro. Of course, we know that didn't happen. Uh, and, and at this point, the all things Alliance are in the rear view, but we're still a ways away from an official brand split. Do you remember it ever being discussed here in 01 to the best of your knowledge? No, I didn't. Uh, you know, I, I think that was probably an idea that Vince had, and he had Rick do the promo. I think that he thought about that idea and it, it ended up festering into something. And I, I think that that was the start of the brand split. At least the thought of the brand split is when Ric Flair said it on TV. And I think Vince kept that in the back of his mind. And a couple of years later, he ended up doing the brand split. So the next week on raw, you team up with Vince McMahon to take on rock and Trish in a tag team match. <laughs> It's set up with a promo. 
where you have to help Vince get through it because he has a sore throat. And the stipulation is if rock and Trish lose rock has to kiss Vince's ass. But if rock and Trish win, Vince would have to kiss the rocks ass. A lot of ass kissing at stake here. What do you remember of this? Yeah, there was just too much ass kissing at this particular time. You know, this is what Vince did. It's what he enjoyed doing. And, uh, you know, you had to be part of it. Uh, there, there was no choice. You didn't, you didn't have a, you didn't have a choice. You didn't have a choice to say yes or no. You just had to do it. So, uh, you're right. It was a lot of ass kissing and, uh, you know, Vince, Vince is just crazy. That's, that's all I can say about him. Uh, rock pins you to win the match. And that forces, uh, Vince to have to kiss the ass of, uh, the rock on SmackDown. You try to attack Vince on SmackDown to save him, but Austin cuts you off. I guess this is not really a lot of momentum for you considering you just turned heel, but that continues into the main event. It's going to be you and Jericho teaming up to lose to rock and Austin. And then you give Jericho an angle slam after the match, but Talk about that tag match, you teaming with Jericho to take on the two biggest stars, maybe in the history of wrestling, rock and Austin. Well, you know, it's, it's something we had to do because it was the four of us, uh, you know, going to be in the undisputed wrestling tournament. And I think they wanted to showcase the match and, uh, give us a little bit each of the match. And, uh, uh, each, each of us got certain spots and I don't think we had enough heat going into vengeance. Um, if anything, I got the wrong kind of heat angle slamming Jericho instead of getting heat on rock or Austin. Cause Jericho and I were the two heels and rock and Austin were the two baby faces. I just thought it was kind of weird that I was angle slamming Jericho, but I understand it at the same time, because there could have been a, a, a particular situation in the tournament where Jericho and I faced off eventually. So I, I understand why they wanted me to get some heat on Jericho. The show, of course, that we're building towards Vengeance 2001 takes place in San Diego, Kurt. Any San Diego memories? Anything stick out about all your visits to San Diego over the years? No, I just remember Ray would bring a bunch of people, Ray Mysterio, because that was his hometown. A bunch of people would come to the arena to, to you know, to see the show. And, uh, you know, Ray is such a good kid that we would meet all of them and, you know, just uh, be cordial to them. But uh, San Diego was Ray Mysterio's hometown. That's all I can remember about it. So of course this show happens on December 9th, and I believe that was your 32nd birthday. What does a guy do on his birthday when he's also working a pay-per-view match against Steve Austin? Well, you're hopefully going to win the tournament. On your birthday. <laughs> Unfortunately I didn't. So, uh, it kind of sucked it. You know, I had a shitty birthday. <laughs> I mean, is there a chance for you to do anything? I mean, do you bring anybody along with you? Do you get together with friends or family before or after, or, Hey, I'll just see y'all. I, I celebrated my birthday the week before with my, with my family. So that was uh, something that we had to do because I knew I was going to be gone on my birthday. Let me ask, you know, you, you sort of joked about, well, it would have been better if I would have won. Do you find out the creative the day of the show, or did you have a good idea before you got to San Diego? Well, I'm not winning. Well, the first thing was, you know, the week before the pay-per-view, I was still supposed to be undisputed champion. Vince McMahon had me picked as the undisputed champion. He wanted me to win the, the two titles. And uh, Vince came to me uh, the week prior to the pay-per-view and said, listen, is it okay with you if I give it to Jericho? Because um, uh, I want to start pushing Jericho, and I think this would be great for him. And I said, no, Vince, you, sh you should do that. I think Jericho needs it. And this is a great opportunity for him. But so I was supposed to win the undisputed championship, but Vince McMahon changed it at the last second and gave it to Jericho. Those stories are fascinating to me just about who, what, when, where, why all of that in hindsight, I think everybody would look at that or even back then and think, well, this is going to be Kurt Angle's night. I mean, certainly you could go uh, with Austin or, or the rock, but they're in another stratosphere. And everything had really gone your way uh, up until this point. I mean, you'd been King of the ring. You'd been European champion. You'd been intercontinental champion. You'd won the world title. Uh, then you had the whole nine 11 thing. And there were so many great moments. It just felt like here's another accolade that can pile on this incredible run you've had. And instead they pivot to Jericho. Did you get to talk to Jericho before the show or after the show or anything like that about his big win? No, I, I didn't discuss it with Jericho, but uh, I completely understood 
I mean, you know, when you're winning all these accolades, uh, sometimes it can get to be too much yeah. and uh, they'd be only focused on you and not the other talent. And I, I think you need to spread it out a little bit so that you create bigger stars and more bigger stars. And uh, so if I would have won the undisputed championship, I'm sure Chris Jericho would have ended up being world champ eventually, but it wouldn't have been his time yet. And he would have had to sit and wait a little bit longer. So I, I was totally for Chris winning the world title, the undisputed championship, because he needed it at that time. Uh, during this show, both yourself and Jericho would confront Ric Flair about never being an undisputed champion himself. <laughs> when you see that, and maybe some of the other interactions you've had since Rick's been here, did you think you would eventually be in the ring working against Flair? Because I know that Flair was brought back with the, the guys that he'll never wrestle. He's just going to be an on-screen character. And of course we know that lasts what, two months. And then by January, he's wrestling Vince at the Royal rumble. But did you think, Hey, maybe there's something there. Maybe I will wrestle Rick here. Uh, you know, knowing he came back, I knew there was a possibility. So I, I, I didn't doubt that he wouldn't be able to wrestle. I, I knew that he could still wrestle. I just didn't know that he, he, um, elected not to, to just be a manager or do whatever on TV, cut promos. Uh, but uh, I'm glad he wrestled because I wanted to wrestle Ric Flair. I believe he's one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. Great, I would say greatest overall sports entertainer of all time. Uh, his promo skills, pre-tapes, matches, they were all very, uh, very, you know, incredible. And uh, Ric Flair, uh, I would put him in the top three greatest of all time because he deserves it. And I, wa I wanted to wrestle him. And I, I was very positive about possibly getting to wrestle him down the road. And I did eventually. So when you say top three greatest of all time, I know you're not counting yourself. So who would the other two guys be in your mind? It's Ric Flair, maybe Shawn Michaels. Who's the third spot? Gosh, that's tough. Um, you know what? It, it, it's, it's, it's wide open, but I would say undertaker rocker Austin. Well, there you go. But it, um, it's high between the three. <laughs> I'm curious about your Ric Flair knowledge at that point. You know, I, we've talked before on the show that growing up as an amateur wrestler and a house full of amateur wrestlers, you guys didn't really grow up watching professional wrestling when you're going through training, you know, with, with the Funkin' dojo and, and Dr. Tom and all that, are you watching old tapes of Ric Flair? Are you watching it once you're on the road and you're catching some that way, or is it only, you know, through the course of your career and maybe now that everything's in our pocket. Like you could watch any Ric Flair show you want on your phone now, but, uh, when did you first become familiar with his work beyond just what you saw, you know, when you guys worked together at the Dory Funkin dojo, really, uh, they, they would play tapes. Yeah. During the day, uh, we would be able to watch matches and Ric Flair was one on the list. You know, we, we watched a lot of great matches, uh, macho man versus Ricky steamboat WrestleMania, you know, we watched a lot of these uh, incredible matches, um, Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels, Iron Man match. Uh, so, so they were, they were showing us tapes and, and it, it allowed me to learn a lot quicker watching tapes and studying tapes. You know, when you're, when you're focused on that match uh, and, and you learn the psychology and all the move sets, uh, you can bring that into the ring and practice. And, and that's how you make it perfect. Let's talk about Austin for a minute here. Is it different working Austin as a heel when he's a baby face? I mean, you, you've wrestled him when he was the good guy, he was the bad guy and you were both or either way. Does he work a different style or in your opinion, as the guy in the ring with him, is it pretty much the same either way? Well, you know, when you work Austin as a baby face, he leads the match. He controls the match. He controls the tempo of the match. Me as a heel and Austin is a baby face. I lead the match. I control the tempo of the match. So it, it was a big difference because I was so used to Austin leading me and tell me where to go and what to do. And then eventually I had to do that for him uh, because, you know, the heel always calls the match. Uh, you're the one that gets the baby face in the rest holds, gets the fans uh, uh, excited and clapping for the baby face. And then you, you know, you ended up going back to wrestling. So uh, you, you have to, you have to walk him through the match as a heel. That, that's your job as a heel. And that, that's what you're doing. You're, you're making the baby face. Did you have a preference? You wanted Austin to be the heel or Austin to be the baby face? 
Well, I felt comfortable at that particular time because I was so new to the business that Austin was the heel and he was leading the match. There you go. But, you know, he taught me enough about what he was doing uh, when he was a heel that uh, I was able to carry him through the matches when I was a heel. Now, in, in hindsight, this is fun to sort of fantasy book. We know that round one of this little miniature tournament is Steve Austin versus yourself. The other side has Jericho and The Rock. Would you have rather faced the rock than Austin or did you prefer wrestling Austin over the rock in this era? Oh, that's tough. They're both really good. Austin was more intense, um, more physical. Uh, the rock was more athletic. Uh, so they were, they were a huge difference between the two, but they were both very effective. I, I'd have to say it's a tie. I can't pick one or the other. Well, the match you guys wound up having was a really good match. You got three and a half stars. According to Dave Meltzer. Uh, he's going to pick up the win, Steve Austin being he. You guys get plenty of time, too, 15 minutes and one second. Meltzer would say Austin posted Angle's left arm a few times. Angle went to the ankle lock several times to work the leg and also did a figure four around the ring post. Angle did three back suplexes for a near fall, then missed a moonsault. Austin came back with five back suplexes for a near fall. Angle used the ankle slam, but Austin kicked out. And Austin came back with a stunner, three and a half stars. Does anything stick out about that match that you can share with us from Vengeance 2001? Um, yeah, you know, it was one of our better matches. It wasn't our best match. Uh, you know, I believe uh, Unforgiven or SummerSlam, uh, those two matches were pretty incredible. Uh, but I, I felt that this match was almost as good, and uh, I really loved working with Austin, and I thought that he was, um, uh, he, he was, at that particular time, the best worker in the business. Let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we will save you money. It's not a matter if it's a matter of how much save with Conrad.com. Meltzer didn't think this match between you two was as good as some of the other matches you had had. And I'm wondering from your perspective, how much of that is because you think maybe Austin knew he had to work Jericho later that same night. Like it just feels like mentally you have to get yourself right to i'm not just going to give my all in this one match i've still got to have some other stuff in the tank and some other tricks up my sleeve for the next match because i know i'm wrestling twice that's a unique challenge for steve austin here on this night is it not yes but austin i, I highly doubt that he was holding back um you know he always won 120 percent uh, i don't believe that for a second he is one intense individual he takes pride in every single match he wrestles. He wants each match that he has to be his very best match. And it doesn't matter if he had to wrestle one, two, three, or four times in one night, he wouldn't hold back any match. That's not Austin style. Some of the old school promoters that I know have told me in their experience, tournaments don't draw as well. The idea being you want to have one big marquee matchup, mono a mono two guys on the poster, if you will. And if you have a tournament and we don't know exactly what the main event is, it's harder to sell and it's harder to get fans to buy in. Do you agree with that? Do you think tournaments are a tougher sell or is that just an excuse? Yes, I do believe that because I honestly believe when you have tournaments, they want a lot of the top guys in the tournament, but what they're trying to do is make a new guy. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have one of the new guys that aren't quite as popular winning the tournament. So you, you want to have all your marquee guys in the pay-per-view and you put them in the, the bracket of the tournament wrestling each other. And then you have the new guy win the tournament and he eventually becomes one, you know, eventually at one particular time, one of the top guys in the company. So when you're pushing the younger guy, the less experienced guy, um, the tournament works out really well. But if you're going to do a, a pay-per-view and you want to do, you want to draw a lot of money, you want the two biggest names in the business going against each other in the main event. That makes sense to me. Uh, I want to remind everybody after you wind up losing the match and then Jericho defeats the rock, you come out and hit Austin with a chair uh, <laughs> and that begins his match with Jericho. So you're still getting the last word as much as you can. Of course, we know that was Jericho's night. He's going to be crowned undisputed champion, but I'm wondering from your perspective, now that you find yourself fresh off survivor series where seemingly you were a baby face. Now you're a heel again. And now there's a heel champion. Does that 
disappoint you financially, maybe because you think, well, I'm not going to be in the title picture because he's going to have to work with a baby face, right? Yes. Yes, it can. Um, you're not going to make quite as much money. You're, you're still main eventing pay-per-views and you're main eventing house shows, uh, at least co-main eventing. So you're still getting paid good money, but when you're the champion, that's where the big bucks come in. That's where the most money uh, gets put uh, in that particular match. So um, knowing that I wasn't champion and I wasn't the top heel anymore, per se, uh, it was a, a little disheartening uh, making less money. Talk to me a little bit about 2001. I mean, this is effectively the end of your 2001. Of course, there's a handful of more shows, but vengeance is the last pay-per-view of 2001. When it's all said and done, how does 2001 rank in your career? As far as your most memorable years? Well, it was as good, every bit as good as my rookie year. And my rookie year was incredible. I, I had a lot of uh, accomplishments in my rookie year. And, and I matched those accomplishments in 2001. So those two years were my two favorite years in the company. And I think it's because I was doing a lot of entertaining stuff and winning a lot of world titles and other titles as well. So, um, you know, I, I eventually started getting better as a wrestler the years after, but those two years were my two most special years. Uh, Brent Barnett has a question for us on Twitter. And if you've got a question for us, we would love to hear them. Uh, it's at the angle pod over on Twitter. Uh, Brent wants to know which finisher was Kurt's favorite, the stone cold stunner, the rock bottom or the walls of Jericho. What was my favorite to take? Yes, sir. Oh gosh. They're all pretty cool. But, uh, taking the stunner from Austin was awesome. You know, just going down and then springing up and, you know, over-exaggerating the stunner was a lot of fun to do. <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to pick that, uh, next week. It's easy. <laughs> yeah. And, and you can use some creative juices, right? The rock found a creative way to take that oh, yeah. every single time. He flopped all over the ring. His legs would hit the ropes and yeah, he, he over-exaggerated big time. It was almost Kurt Henning esque, but super fun either way. You're absolutely right. <laughs> uh, next week, we're going to be talking about your match at final resolution, 2011. So instead of going back 20 years, we'll go back 10 years and 10 years ago this month, you were wrestling the cowboy James storm. You're not in the main event, which is rare for you here, but you're looking to get revenge on storm for winning the TNA title for Mew, And it still just blows me away, dude, that as much fun as we've had talking about your WWE run. You spent more time in TNA. So we'll be talking about that next week. Uh, in two weeks, we're doing something pretty special. I don't want to uh, tip our hands yet, but we've got something really fun planned. We'll call it a reunion. Uh, and then uh, as we get closer to Christmas, we're going to have the angle family Christmas the day after Christmas, you did something called the angle family Christmas on raw on Christmas day, 2000. We're going to have a lot of fun here in the coming weeks here on the show. <laughs> yes, we will, especially for Christmas. <laughs> I, uh, I'm having a lot of fun in the meantime, because I've been ordering all my stocking stuffers for the wrestling fan in my life. And of course I'm talking about chicken snacks, physically fit.com is where to go. And Kurt, you've got a lot of great flavors and there's a lot of great protein, right? Yes. Chicken snacks and snack, smart, crispy protein bites. There's chicken protein and there's organic plant protein. There are 11 different flavors, sweet barbecue, sriracha, honey, mustard, cinnamon swirl, you name it, we have it. They're high protein, low carbohydrate. Go to physicallyfit.com to order yours. Check it out, physicallyfit.com. And when you get there, you can click where to buy. And uh, I've got several within driving distance to me, but I just got to tell you, I've gotten hooked on that little link at the bottom that says order now online. You got all the different flavors right there, but here's what's really cool. When you use our special promo code AnglePod, you're going to save yourself some money. So that's physicallyfit.com. Don't forget the promo code. You'll save it off your entire order. And uh, that's anglepod.com. I'm sorry, anglepod is the promo code. Physicallyfit.com is the website. I do want to tell everybody that we have a gold, Kurt Angle Gold Card member for Ooh. Chicken Snacks. And you, you, if you become a member, it's on the website. I have to be a member. You get 20% off forever. Holy cow. I'm looking at I that right now. First order. Yeah, dude. That's only two 99. Why would you not do that? Go lock that in right that. now. Uh, th there's a handful left there. Wow. This is limited and it's three bucks. It's under three bucks. Go check it out right now. 
Uh, that's uh, physicallyfit.com. Click on where to buy, and then you'll see order now online at the bottom. Goodness gracious, 20% forever. How do you beat that? You can't beat it. <laughs> uh, KurtAnglebrand.com, though, man. This is a, a great place if you're looking for another type of stocking stuffer for the wrestling fan in your life. You've got birthday cards. Man, you've got everything. You've got cowboy hats. Uh, you've got milk cartons. You, you're even doing video messaging now. So if you want to send somebody a, a message from Kurt Angle for Christmas, that's a thing over at KurtAnglebrand.com, right? Yes, we got everything. Milk cartons, cowboy hats, photos, uh, birthday cards, T-shirts, video messages. Go to KurtAnglebrand.com and order whatever you want. I kept the prices very affordable. I mean, a birthday card is only 26 bucks. An autographed photo is only $31. Very affordable rates. I wanted to keep them affordable to thank all the fans for supporting me. Kurt, as you can tell from behind me, I'm a big wrestling belt fan. And I think you've got a couple of hand, uh, a couple of, uh, Kurt angle championship belts. And this is not a replica. There's only a handful of these, but this is the real deal. Oh, there it is right there. Look at that. Yes. Now they made me one. There's only five. This is number six. The, the five have the black, uh, leather strap. This one has the blue. This is my baby right here. And, uh, the, you can order these at wildcatbelts.com. Um, there are only four left, and uh, they're going to go pretty quickly. So uh, anybody that wants a Kurt Angle World Heavyweight Championship, this is a beautiful title, one of the most beautiful titles I've ever seen. Go to wildcatbelts.com and order yours. Dude, I, I got to get one of those. That thing's awesome. And by the way, I just want to give a shout-out to Wildcat. If you've ever seen Monday Night Raw or or or, or – WWE SmackDown on Friday night. He makes their belts. This is the yeah. same belt maker that makes the belts for the WWE. And now he's got a Kurt Angle championship. It's your authentic Kurt Angle American Hero Limited Series Custom Design Championship Belt. Wildcatbelts.com. Dude, that's super cool. Congratulations on that. That is cool. I, I'm really happy that this guy decided to make a world title uh in remembrance of me and uh what I was able to accomplish in my career and uh, they'll have only five. That's very special. That's very unique, very rare. So anybody that gets these, you're only going to have one of five of them, uh, five in the whole entire world. Check it out. It's uh, wildcatbelts.com. Don't forget KurtAnglebrand.com and most importantly, physicallyfit.com. I can't believe you're giving away 20% forever. Go join the club, okay. click where to buy and order now online. It's uh, physicallyfit.com. And if you've got a question for us, you want to interact with the show. Well, that's easy. Just hit us on Twitter at the angle pod. Kurt, today was a lot of fun. I love talking about 2001, but I'm pumped to talk about TNA next week right here. Me too. And I missed you, Conrad. Glad to be back, baby. And we'll see you next yeah. week and every week right here on the Kurt Angle Show. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.